rocks. Today we're talking all about fermented foods in the microbiome with Janice from Nourished by Nature. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe, like, rate and share them so that we can get found by more people. And if you want to find out more about my work, my online courses, foraging courses and one-to-one work, you can go to www.trossockswildapothecary.com. Enjoy the podcast. Hi, I'm really excited to have Janice here from Nourished by Nature. Um, and we're going to be talking about fermented foods and the microbiome, which is a topic that I'm really, really excited about. I love reading about the microbiome and I just find it completely amazing and fascinating. But when I read too much into it, I do end up getting really freaked out. <laughs> I just like see like little microbes everywhere. But um, so I thought we could start by just if you just talk about who you are, how you got into this what line this what line of work yeah sure well yeah i am a yeah janice klein i'm a, a food scientist actually to background and um, i worked in food research for about 10 years um, and i've always been interested in health and nutrition and diet i've always you know cooked my own food and uh, like gardening you know that kind of stuff i had i was actually doing a phd to be honest and uh, i discovered i was expecting my first baby so I just decided, well, no, never mind. I've got a master's in analytical biochemistry. I thought, who needs a PhD? I'm going to be a mum. So that was far more exciting. So I never actually completed the PhD. Uh, I went away, had my baby, came back. To, I did go back to work for a couple of years then. I was expecting again. So I just decided to stay home. I've now got, I've got four girls and I had the best time ever just looking after them uh, and cooking and, you know, yeah, just enjoying being a mum. And that was a massive privilege for me to be able to do that. So I just stepped back from the whole sort of sciencey world, whatever, and just enjoyed myself for quite a number of years, which I was very lucky to do. And then um, in 2011, a, a long time after that, my friend who um, is a, an expert in macrobiotics um, had been living in Portugal, came back to the UK uh, and said that they were doing a, a course on macrobiotics. Um, would I be interested in joining in? And I thought, well, actually, that sounds great because at the time Gwyneth Paltrow was doing microbiotic and microbiotic means big life. And I thought, yeah, that sounds great because I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but I've got a massive interest in food. And when I had done the course, that really brought home the link between our food and our health. And it was based on really sound principles. I mean, it really does make a lot of sense to eat a microbiotic diet because it's all about balance in the diet. It's all about eating seasonal. It's all about, well, there's like no sugar, no processed stuff, pretty much no alcohol and the usual, but very, very healthy diet. But it was a wee bit too limited for me. There was a lot of um, like tamari and miso and ginger. And that was where my introduction to the world of sort of fermented foods um, came. Um, because we were using um, tamari, which is an actually fermented soy, uh, introduced things like miso. We used to make miso soup, and miso is an actually fermented. And we made at the time, uh, and of course, we were shown how to make a simple sauerkraut, but I know now that we actually weren't making it right, and we weren't fermenting it for long enough either, But and it didn't taste that great. But that was my introduction to it, um, and that really got my interest. And it was at that point, and we've got four girls, one of them's vegan and has been vegan for 15 years, and um, we're, we're all vegetarian, and really, after I did the macrobiotics, I stopped eating meat. I just thought, okay, I'm not doing it anymore. So I'm plant-based. Uh, the whole family is plant-based now. And I, I stopped eating meat in 2011. Don't really eat processed foods at all. I make all my own foods. But now I get so into all of the fermented stuff and it makes you feel so good that you, you just want to keep eating it. So I started off making just like sauerkraut. Uh, then I discovered kombucha. I actually came across an article and it was Ronald Reagan at the time. And um, an article, and he was actually attributing drinking kombucha to curing his stomach cancer because he had Hello. stomach cancer. And again, I thought, well, that's a bit of a big claim. But anyway, it didn't keep my interest with the kombucha. That was about eight, nine years ago before kombucha became sort of cool and trendy. Yeah. And I wanted to try it. So it was, you couldn't really get it. Anyway, I managed to find one place I could get it and I bought two bottles. It was five pounds each for the bottles, very expensive. Um, and I got it and I tried a glass and I thought to myself, I didn't know if I liked it or not. I thought, oh, that's a bit strange. Put it back in the fridge. And every time I went past the fridge, I opened it and had another glass. And before I knew it, I was like, think that stuff is absolutely uh, it's so so good I couldn't stop drinking it I became addicted to it very very fast before I knew it I had drank a whole bottle 
And I just thought to myself at first, that's a bit odd. I wasn't sure about it because it's got a slightly vinegary tang to it. But once I started to drink it, it was almost like my body was craving it. Mm-hmm. It was like that, have more of that, have more of that. So I, I drank it. It was too expensive. So I decided I'm just going to start making it myself. So I've been growing my own kombucha for, yeah, since 2011. Uh, and I now have a whole ro- load of scobies, all with names. I make um, coffee kombucha, I do green tea kombucha, I have um, hibiscus, I do all sorts of different things and I've become totally obsessed by the whole thing. Oh, see, I've so, got a kombucha, but I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling a little bit um, weirded out by the, <laughs> the scoby. Well, I'm not doing a lot with it. The first time I did get a scoby, the girls were horrified, like, what yeah. is that? healing thing but I absolutely I, I love them so much they are fantastic wee things I use scobies as a face mask I mean I make all my own probiotic skincare I've got very sensitive okay. skin and um, I, I don't use anything with perfume I make all my own it's all probiotic so I use whey and kefir and I use kombucha toners I use scoby as a face mask uh, there is incredible things that you can do right. in fact you've got a whole are you just I wrote playing? a poem called Ode to a Scoby, um, which is on my YouTube channel, and it's all about scobies and kombucha <laughs> and all the amazing things that you can do with them. Um, because scobies are, they're, they're, are we um, symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. They are antimicrobial, they're antibacterial, they're antifungal. If you have any skin condition, cuts, burns, fungal infections, anything, if you put a piece of scoby on them, it'll just, it just heals things. And they're actually working on making us like a living bandage. Um, scobies, again, you can oxygen can get through. And again, all the stuff in the scoby just starts to heal things. I cut my finger really badly one day. And normally I would have put seaweed on it, which I didn't have any seaweed. So I got a bit of scoby and I put that around the cut. And it was bleeding quite a bit. I wrapped it in cling film and left it. Took it off about half an hour later, put another bit on. And then after I took that bit off half an hour later, you would have not actually known I had a cut. It totally stopped bleeding. It totally healed up. And they're just miraculous wee things, but they work in such a, a clever way. You know, they don't cause any damage. They're quite vinegary, but they are so antimicrobial. There's been all sorts of research um, about using them for different things. You can put them in your space. I've got a scoby, as I say, a scoby face mask, cut holes out in a, a mouth, but I've got a really big one. Uh, you and that, the same, are you using the same one over and over? Absolutely not. No, no, no. Uh, I have a scoby. I've got lots of skincare scobies that uh, I use for if I'm going to be doing other things. And I've also got, I've got brewing scobies, so I keep them obviously separate. But I've got so a scoby. They, they, make, they come in like layers. So are you, do you yes. peel off a layer and separate yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing about them. They just keep growing. Yeah, so that's what I'm kind of thinking. That's my, one of my questions, actually, because mine just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I'm kind of wondering, am I supposed to take take some yeah. of it away, put it somewhere yeah. else, increase the amount of liquid in it? Or, you know, yeah. Because you do need to do that. It was one of my friends who had given a scoby and she was making her own kombucha and she said to me, oh, my kombucha's getting really vinegary. And I'm like, oh, okay then. And I'd sort of been through various things. I actually had gone to a house for lunch and when I looked in her, her uh, jar, I thought, no wonder, she had about, she must have had about six really big scobies in the jar. So the jar was half full of scobies, so she could hardly get any tea in it. So I'm like, that, well, that's why it's vinegary. You have to move them out. You can keep two or three in the one brewing container, and that's fine. But again, if the, the more you have, the less room there is to get tea in it. So you need to, at some point, split them up. What you can do is you can set up a separate jar and just keep like a scoby hotel and you can keep all your spare ones in there or you can set up a different one and if you're making green tea kombucha you could make hibiscus kombucha instead and if you've got a scoby hotel are you putting tea with that as well or just yeah you need to keep them in liquid i mean it yeah. can be just strong starter tea or yeah you need to have some kind of either strong just kombucha that you've already made that's strong or you need to make up some fresh tea but you need to put some starter tea in as well and the reason that you need to do that is if you just make up sweetened tea and you put a scoby in the yeast get to work first and they use all the sugar up but it's the bacteria that will protect it from mold and they don't tend to kick in until slightly after the yeast have used up the sugar if you put the starter tea in, you're adding more bacteria, which basically just protects it from mold. Okay, okay. So that's why you have to do that. But I do, I love kombucha. I make probiotic ice lollies with kombucha. And I, I make all sorts of things. I know, I saw that on your, you have amazing recipes that you just have yeah. um, fermented food in, in everything. Um, I do. Just one I have question. Sorry, <laughs> just another question. I have about, 
Um, another question about kombucha. Do you, are you using? Do you always use black tea as a starter, or can you change? No, I actually use green tea. I don't. I'm not, I'm not a fan of black tea kombucha. It's too strong for me. I use. Uh, I, I started off. When I got mine, it was a green tea scoby. It's called Jamie, that's my Scottish scoby. Uh, and uh, it's green tea. And I prefer green tea kombucha because it's got a much, um, it's got a, a milder taste. And I, I love to flavour all my kombuchas as well. So I mean, I add in tons of flavours. So I find that green tea is, it just lends itself to more flavours. One of my favourite ones is just mint in the summer. I grow loads of mint. So a couple of big sprigs of mint and stick them in once I've bottled it. And that is fantastic and mint's good for your digestion as well and it tastes great. I do other ones with all other herbs like lavender, chamomile, rosemary, they all work really well but they work better in a, in a delicate base like a green tea base. Okay. If you've got black tea kombucha it's got a stronger flavour. Okay. Yeah but it's a, it's, a, it's a personal preference that's all it is. And if you leave it for a long period of time can you then use it as a vinegar instead of vinegar? Yeah, yeah. oh yes absolutely I have many um, and again I've got so many I must have about 10 different ones I couldn't possibly have them all going at the same time but when I was running workshops and, and I mean the, the idea behind the workshops is to have as many different ones to show people and let people try different things so I have a, my dining room is full of scobies at all different stages and um, so what I do is I have at the moment I've been making elderflower kombucha so I've got my green tea scobies doing that and uh, I've, I made last week I made hibiscus this week I made um, um, the, the green tea with elderflower I, I do rhubarb apple and ginger so it's a bit of a seasonal thing for me and mm -hmm. um, I make coffee kombucha as well which is absolutely delicious and yeah. um, but I don't drink that much of the coffee kombucha so you know, if you're not using them they'll sit quite happily as long as you've got them sitting in some um, starter tea or just some kombucha or whatever flavour you've got or whatever type you're making and that's the key thing if you let them dry out you'll get mould on them. Right okay and is there a, a length of time that you have to that you can keep them in the water that you can change you have well, to you can keep them for months and months and months but you will end up eventually <laughs> with vinegar um, yeah. which is fine you can use that as a hair rinse it makes a fantastic cleaner because I make all my I don't I've got incredibly sensitive skin I'm allergic to something called linalool which is a natural thing, it's in essential oils and all sorts, but it's in pretty much everything with fragrance, it's in loads of cleaning products. So I, I just make all my own stuff, so I save myself a fortune and I know that I'm not damaging my skin by using things that are, you know, that are, that are you know, killing and uh, the, the uh, sort of damaging the acid mantle in my skin. So yeah, I, I just make everything Instead of like apple cider vinegar as well, can't you? Okay. Yeah, you can do apple cider yeah, vinegar well. great as well, but yeah, kombucha yeah. vinegar is even better because it's got more probiotics. Apple yeah. cider vinegar is fabulous because it's obviously made from apples and it's got lots of pectin in it. And pectin is a prebiotic. Mm -hmm. So apple cider vinegar is more, it's got prebiotic benefits, so it feeds the good bacteria in your gut. But it's, it's great stuff. But I, I find a lot of people actually use like apple cider vinegar meat and do like shots of apple cider vinegar. It's yeah. really acidic. It's about pH 2. It will strip the enamel off your teeth. So I wouldn't I'd recommend you do that. If you're doing it, dilute it, mm -hmm. you know, and do it that way. There's also, I've, I have a, a drink that I make quite a lot as well. I make it from a workshop. It's called Switchel and it's using apple cider vinegar. It's got maple syrup, it's got ginger and lemon and water and it's absolutely delicious. Mm. But it's it's quite diluted. So you're getting the benefits, but in a, you know, and not in that sort of acidic form. Yeah, and that's a lovely drink. And again, I've started a YouTube channel, so I've got the switch loads on that as well, so you can see exactly how to make it. So you don't need to have a scoby to do that. You can just make it if you've got some nice raw um, organic apple cider vinegar, the one with the mother. So then you have more benefits. Yeah, I was having a look at your YouTube channel. It's great. Um, I was oh, looking at the. I've started it, but I know uh, it's great though because there's loads of information on there already, which is really good. Like I already learned about the because um, I do. Um, water kefir as well oh, yeah. and that one I'm, I'm i'm happy with it's a bit easier at the moment than uh kombucha but i'm gonna it is easier. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, profile though that's the thing water kefir I, I prefer kombucha myself because to me kombucha is like a fine wine it just gets better water kefir for me it doesn't keep well so i mean i i do like my two favorite flavors of water kefir are orange and passion fruit and also just lemon and lime or cucumber mm -hmm. and mint and it's almost, it's a really nice drink, but it, it, for me, if you don't drink it within maybe two or three days of making it, it starts to taste that kind of yeasty alcoholic way that I don't like. Mm. Maybe it's just my grains, I don't know, but it doesn't, to me, it doesn't keep the same, and it can get explosively fizzy. 
Yeah. And I've had two, <laughs> explosions, yeah, two explosions, both with water kefir. It was last year and I had been really busy. I had so many drinks and I'd run out of bottles and someone had given me two clip top bottles, but it was the ones that are get, get square shoulders, if you uh-huh. like. So yeah, and they were coloured glass, but I had nothing else. So I had made up two. I had one that was, I think, I think grapefruit and rosemary. And I had another one, which was a fruity one. I had one of them in the dining room because I had a workshop coming up and I wanted to make it nice and fizzy. So I had one in the dining room um, and uh, I, I heard a noise in the middle of the night. What the heck's that? I came down, totally smashed to smithereens. Gotcha. And I thought, that's so I cleared it all up, went back to my bed. And then about uh, an hour later, the one in the kitchen, that totally exploded as well. And both of them were in those bottles with the, the squ- sort of square shoulders. Mm-hmm. So again, really, you need to have decent uh, clip top bottles. Yeah. Uh, that could have been really dangerous. Luckily, there was no one around. It was just a mess to clean up. Or sometimes when you open them, I don't, I don't know if you've ever had that. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> on my ceiling. <laughs> all over the place. And yeah. it's all, usually all quite sticky because it's kind of yeah. straight. It's funny, but it's not funny trying to clear it up. Yeah. The kombucha doesn't tend to do that quite so much. Although my coffee kombucha is always incredibly fizzy. And that's the thing. People are always like, how do you make it fizzy? But the mistake, the mistake with kombucha that people make is they leave it until it's quite vinegary and then they try and get flavour. What you need to do is you have to bottle it when it's still slightly sweet, which means that the yeasts are still active. And it's the yeast that will use up the sugar. If you then add some other fruit or something, the yeast use up that sugar and they create carbon dioxide, which gives you the fizz. If you leave your kombucha too long and it tastes a bit vinegary and then you're trying to get fizz, it's really quite difficult because most of the yeast are inactive by that stage. Yeah. Yeah. So again, and, and you need to leave it long enough as well for it to happen because people expect, oh, I put, you know, or what people will do with kombucha is put maybe two bits of fruit in, leave it for a day and expect it to be fantastically <laughs> full of flavour and fizz and like that. Well, absolutely, that won't happen. I just think, so I put lots in, I pack loads in. To all of mine because I love flavours and again what you're doing when you're adding things like pureed fruit or fresh orange and passion fruit you're adding more vitamins you're adding more live enzymes so it's all good stuff you're adding and yeah okay you're adding a bit of sugar as well but all the other good stuff so I just like the big flavours I'm a massive foodie I don't eat food I don't like I don't drink things I don't like either uh, and I just like to pile in all the benefits that's why as I say on my Instagram and Facebook I'm continually thinking how can I make that healthier? How can I add prebiotics to that? Or can I add a probiotic element to things? Um, and again, I've just become, I can't help myself doing it. I actually, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I have an idea. I'm like, that, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> probiotic chocolate was one of those things. I was making chocolate bark one day with dark chocolate and I'd melted it with coconut oil. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder if I could make that probiotic. The idea that if you heat probiotics, you'll kill them. So, I mean, you can't boil them up with them. And if you boil them up with chocolate, you've killed them. And I thought at the time I had some coffee kombucha, which I had second fermented with frozen cherries and about a maple syrup. And it tasted like Tia Maria. It was absolutely mm-hmm. delicious. So what I did was I melted the chocolate with the coconut oil, cooled it down a bit, checked the temperature and let it cool to about 40. And then I stirred in a cup of my coffee kombucha and it went all absolutely lovely and glossy, poured it into a tree, and then I topped it with um, nuts and seeds and all sorts and put it in the freezer. And it was the most delicious thing ever. So now uh, you can do it, I do it with my homemade soya kefir as well. It's exactly the same thing. And that's a brilliant thing to do for kids because I use da- the dark chocolate. So I use 70%, which has got a bit of sugar, but not too much. It's not, I don't like the really bitter chocolate. So 70% chocolate, two bars, melt it, put in a glass bowl, a tablespoon of coconut oil, melt it, cool it down a wee bit, and then you can add, if you don't have kombucha or kefir, you can add yogurt. Mm -hmm. And that's just adding a probiotic element to it. And again, I make um, organic soya kefir, and what I do with that is I flavour it with a bit of lemon, so that's got a lovely flavour as well. I make coconut kefir, so you can um, add coconut. Is that with the, the milk kefir grains that you're using? Yeah, that is, yes, absolutely. But I also, I've got water kefir grains and I've also got milk kefir grains. I started off, I don't do dairy, actually. I've never done dairy, but I, I started off when uh, part of this journey. Obviously, I wanted to, I would do one thing and then I'd think, right, next I'm going to try that. So now I do everything. I do sourdough, I make milk kefir, uh, uh, water kefir, kombucha. I've got a fridge full of fermented veggies. But the reason that I wanted to try 
milk heifer is, it is the most probiotic thing on the planet. It's got up, upwards of 40 different probiotics. It's incredible stuff, really beneficial for gut issues. It's really good for skin issues. And I know that dairy is not, but fermented dairy is a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the most probiotic thing. I don't like dairy, I've never liked it. So I wasn't for thinking, great, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna drink it. But what I did do was I started putting it in my skin. Okay. Uh, and that's what I do. I mean, I, as I say, I had really sensitive skin. I had to stop using everything, anything with perfume. Uh, and what I do now is I just use probiotics. So I make my milk kefir. I then pour it through a nut milk bag and I separate it out into curds and whey. Mm -hmm. So you've got the liquid stuff is whey. And that's what you find in a lot of the, the shops. You know, bodybuilders are obsessed by the powdered whey. <laughs> it's really good. But, but the thing is, the stuff that I make is just organic and it's incredibly beneficial. It's also got probiotics in it, so you can use the clear whey. You can make a fizzy drink with that. If you just take a quarter of a cup and add it to some juice, so that will ferment it and it will be fizzy. You can use it to make your bread. You can do all sorts of things, but that's how my mind works now. I've got so many different things going on that I've got lots of different options for things I can try. But I use the whey, that's what I don't wash my face. I use the whey, that's what I use to uh, cleanse my face. It supports collagen um, production, it's antibacterial, it's antimicrobial. It just supports your skin on every level it's the same ph as your skin doesn't strip any of the natural oils off your skin and i also use it as a, um, a hair rinse as well and so it's the way the that you're using for that it's the way the clear stuff yes but yeah. what i then do with the other you can actually use kefir just directly and put it in your face so when i when i strain it through my my strainer i just put the rest of it i just slap it all over my face it doesn't make you smell a bit danish right <laughs> enough but it doesn't really bother me anymore i'm used to it all right so i'm or i make masks and scrubs and all sorts so I don't buy anything, I just make it all myself. And are you using cow's milk or goat's milk? Or? Yeah, no, I use, it's organic dairy that I do for that, but I don't drink that. I also make uh, organic soy kefir mm -hmm. uh, and I make coconut kefir and that's what I drink and that's what I put in my overnight oats and my porridge and blend it into my smoothies. Uh, I don't really do. I did, in fact, the one a lady that came along to a few of my workshops last year had actually managed to get raw milk, raw organic milk. Yeah. Now, again, raw organic milk is a whole different thing to, you know, pasteurised milk. And she'd given me, so she gets it, this frozen. So I thought, oh, actually, I'm just going to try it because I thought that will give my grains a real boost. The grains can never use the lactose in the milk. That's their food source. And traditionally, it was raw organic milk that the grains were used to. And I thought that would give my grains a great boost. So when I made the raw organic kefir I actually did drink it because it was so beneficial mm -hmm. uh, and I thought uh, I'd actually made it so it was nice and mild it was smooth and I thought this is like fantastic stuff I'm just drinking it um, and so, so the flavour totally different with the with the yeah milk. and it was just it, it's very mild but if you want to make okay. milk kefir to drink then a lot of people what they do is they over ferment it so it just becomes horrible it's like sour milk the yeah. way that I would do it if I'm going to drink it is it's a tablespoon of milk kefir greens two cups of your organic milk what you, what you do I do is I'd, I'd leave it at room temperature for 24 hours put a cloth on it and what you need to do with kefir with milk kefir especially the grains tend to sit at the top so you have to give it a shake every now and again to mix the grains in with the milk. Leave it for 24 hours, then what I would do is put it in the fridge for 24 hours with the grains still in it, then bring it out, then take the grains out, put your milk kefir into a bottle, and then what I do is put a bit of lemon zest in. The lemon zest is fantastic stuff for your gut microbiome because it's got pectin and it's got polyphenols and it gives your milk kefir a fantastic flavour without having to add, if you add things like fruit to milk kefir, it tends to separate out. And it's a bit yucky unless you're going to drink it right there. But if you use lemon, that just seems to give it a fantastic flavor and it boosts the vitamin content and everything as well. And then what I do is then just store it in the fridge with the lemon still in the bottle. Okay. But the mistake that a lot of people make is they over ferment it and it just tastes horrible. I mean, it just tastes like sour milk and who wants to drink that? <laughs> Also, what I was going to say is when I started off at first with milk kefir grains, I got them, someone gave me them, uh, and I started making it. But the problem is, it's a 24-hour fermentation or 40 hours at the most. Then what you need to do, you've got to, when you take the grains out, you have to give them more milk. It, or, you know, you can't just leave them. You've got to put more milk in. So I was ending up, I, was, I didn't know what to do with it all. So I ended up putting it in my bath. It was like Cleopatra. I was, because it was really good for your skin. But I didn't want to keep buying organic dairy because I, I don't really, I don't support the dairy industry particularly. I don't, and I don't really do dairy. But 
I wanted the benefits of having the milk kefir grains. And at that point, I was making also non-dairy kefir, but because I was using the tins of coconut milk that I was using made nice kefir, but the grains only, it worked okay for a couple of times and I had to refresh them back in the dairy just to give them a boost because the natural food source is the lactose in the milk. Yeah. The mistake a lot of people make when they try to make the non-dairy ones, they buy the cartons, the, you know, the cartons that you can buy, you can buy all sorts like soya and uh, cashew and almond or whatever, but the majority of them have got hardly any food. I mean, most of it is mostly water. And a lot of them have got additives and emulsifiers. The grains yeah. don't do well with those. So mm -hmm. what you might find is you might be able to make maybe one batch or two batches and the grains start to just look a bit shriveled up and they're not happy or they'll fall out of the milk. What happens is you'll get that fermentation happens really fast because there's no food for the grains. So if you're doing a, like a, a carton of plant milk with your kefir grains and you leave it sitting on the side, you'll probably find within about four or five hours it will separate out into two distinct layers and the grains will be sitting at the bottom because there's no food. Yeah, right. But, but I have discovered that if you use organic soy, and there's two, three brands, Provamel is just pure organic. It's just soy and water and nothing else. There's Sujade, which is a French make, which is exactly the same, and it's French, it's non-geo, it's organic. Um, so, I mean, it's absolutely great stuff. And I have been making soya kefir with the same grains for about six weeks two months and they're actually okay and I can tell because I know what the grains are supposed to look like they're supposed to be nice and plump and they've got a nice coating on them you can tell when they start to get a bit sad and a bit weak looking then you then need to either give them a food source or put them back in the organic dairy and just let them have a bit of a rest because these are real living organisms the same with scobies you know and that, that you need to look after them you have to give them the right conditions for them to be able to you know to, to grow and give you something that's going to give you massive benefits when you actually drink it yeah that's interesting because i yeah i was thinking about the the um non-milk the milk kefir yeah that you needed to refresh them i did i had read that before and yeah. i have made milk kefir before and i think i must must have left it a bit long because <laughs> it was quite horrible. It is, it's horrible, but the thing is, if you do it the way that I've said, and you just do it yeah. in 24 hours, 24 hours in the fridge, it's lovely and smooth, and if you put a bit of lemon in it, it just gives it a beautiful flavour, so it doesn't taste like sour milk. It's like a thick pouring yoghurt, that's what it's like. Okay. But again, it depends on the strength and the quality of your grains, but I know, because I've been doing it for so long, you can tell when it starts to ferment, because it will start. you'll start to get wee pockets of like whey, so I can tell if you leave it too long, if you've got your milk kefir and you leave it sitting out in the side, when you get that total separation, so you've got solids at the top and liquid at the bottom, you've over fermented it and that's going to taste horrible. You can still drink it, it'll still have probiotic benefits, but it's not going to taste good. Yeah. Or another thing that I, what I do now is because I use the whey and the kefir for my skin, what I do is I don't leave it sitting out at, at, at room temperature at all. I just keep it always in the fridge. So I just keep topping it up with my, my organic milk in the fridge and I can leave it in the fridge. It takes about maybe about a week to ferment, which gives you the time because you don't, I don't use lots of it. So I don't want those, but I want to keep my grains active and, um, you know, keep them fed. So that, that's a good thing to do. And again, I can tell because I just look at the jar in the fridge and I can tell when it's starting to separate out. And that's when I'll then sort of, you know, sort of separate it out into the curds and whey. Right. Um, yeah, but there's all sorts of things. But again, it's just knowing what you're doing with things. A lot of the time people try to ferment things, but they don't understand a, either the process. They don't really understand what they're doing. And they don't understand that they're working with really living organisms that need, they need food, they need the right temperature, you know. So you, you've got to understand what you're doing a wee bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also do a lot of um, vegetable fermenting as well, don't you? Oh yeah, oh my, you should see my fridge. <laughs> uh, I've got, my, my fridge is full, the girls, the family usually says there's no room in the fridge for anything else, but I have a, ki a fridge in the kitchen, that's for actual food. My, uh, I have a fermented fridge, which is in the utility room, it's just full of all my fermented stuff and all my kombuchas, my sourdough starters and everything else. But, but fermented veggies are actually one of the best and easiest things because you don't need any cultures. All you're doing is you're harnessing the bacteria that are on the veg um, and all you need is a glass jar and some salt. And f fermenting veggies, that, that is one of the safest ways to preserve food. And the cool thing is when you ferment something like a cabbage, for example, you make sauerkraut with the cabbage, uh, everything good increases by a huge amount. The vitamin C content shoots up markedly. 
things get broken down. Uh, it's incredible stuff that happens when you ferment anything by a natural process. What you're doing is the microbes are actually transforming everything for you. They're breaking everything down. So all this stuff is difficult to digest. Everything gets broken down into smaller bits. And the, the really cool thing is any bad stuff basically buggers off. Any bad stuff goes and all the good stuff is enhanced by a huge amount. So anything fermented, the way I look at it is it's pre-digested, so it's much easier for your body to use. So when you eat something that's been fermented, you know, your wee microbes in your gut are saying, no, oh, thank you, you've given me something, I can totally get it. It's broken down, you know, and it, your body can use every aspect of that. The problem being with food these days, so much food is not even real food. There's so much stuff that goes into it that your body doesn't know what it is. So much of it negatively impacts on your wee gut bacteria that are in there trying to do a good job. Yeah. And, you know, so many people just don't make good choices. Yeah. And what I'm really all about is just to trying to get people to understand what your gut bacteria need to thrive. And that is fiber. It is fiber. It is plants. And it's not the same things. I ask people all the time, oh, what do you eat? And everyone's, oh, I eat really healthily. Oh, what do you eat? Oh, I eat chicken. I eat fish. I eat five a day. And I'm like, okay, well, chicken's not healthy for a start. And a lot of fish isn't healthy either. But what's your five a day? They eat the same five a day. I'll eat carrots, I eat broccoli, I eat bananas and onions and maybe tomatoes. It's the same five. And if you if that's all you do, you're not getting that diversity into your diet. If you just eat the same five, you're basically what you're doing is you're feeding a small subset of your gut bacteria because there are tons of different types of fiber, soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, resistant starch, inulin, loads of them. Mm -hmm. And there's trillions of microbes in your gut. They all like different things. It's like your family or your kids. If you've got kids, you know, and you're like one of them, you're only this week, I'm only eating bananas this week. So the poor wee one that doesn't like bananas is going to sit sulking in the corner because it's not been fed. That's how I look at your gut microbes. You have to give them a food source. If you give them a food source, they will then go on and do, you know, fantastic stuff for you, but they won't do it if there's no food source. Yeah, and they're very resilient, aren't they? They can actually change so quite yeah. rapidly. So you, you can make a change to your diet and change of course the can. That's the really cool thing. And again, the whole microbiome stuff, I, I obviously am totally obsessed by that as well because I'm a scientist, the background. I must have every book on gut health uh, ever. And it is so fascinating to me. I can't stop finding out about it. And the thing is, they're only really just, it's the tip of the iceberg of the information that they now know. But every aspect of your health is coming from your gut. Every single thing all disease starts in your gut if you can get your gut microbiome sorted out then you'll enjoy good health uh, so your immunity 80 percent of your immune system is in your gut serotonin the majority of your serotonin your happy hormones produced in your gut and uh, you know the, the, the microbes in your gut fight inflammation for you and most chronic disease inflammation is at the root of, of it and a lot of the time it's like this low level inflammation that people just deal with and think oh well that's as good as I'm going to feel but it's, it's actually not the case at all if you eat the right diet you've got the right balance of microbes in your gut they are continually working in your behalf damping down inflammation communicating with your immune system making vitamins for you all your B vitamins all made in your gut by microbes vitamin K made in your gut by microbes you know they're raiding into your immune system all the time keeping things ticking over all your cravings come from your gut it's your gut sending messages to your brain it's not the other way around amazing, isn't it and I, it's amazing that they found out that it's basically you you're only really 10 percent human it's like your big toe yeah. is like your humanness and the rest of it's all yeah. microbes i think that's just amazing <laughs> well the, I, i'm reading a book actually at the moment which is fascinating it's called 10 percent human and again it, they were actually saying when the, the, the human genome project in 2002 so the technology was there it was like oh great we're going to find out all the human genes that would be really interesting and there, were, there must be loads of them they find out that the human genome there's only 210,000. But like a water flea has 220,000 like that. How the hell is that? Because years later, when it came to the microbiome, we'd get 4.4 million microbial genes. So we are way outnumbered by microbes. We would be dead without them. We wouldn't be alive. We have microbes on every surface of our skin, in our nose, in our mouth, in our gut, everywhere. And it's all different ones. We've got about 4,000 different species that all do different things. You know, and the microbiome is now considered as a separate organ. It's your second brain, your gut intuition. Who listens to that anymore? <laughs> and it's there as a very, very powerful tool if people would only understand. And instead of that, people are, you know, totally confused. Will I eat this? Will I eat that? Can you tell me what I can eat? Will I eat that? And the, the reality of it is there is not a one diet. It's, it's, it, there's no one diet that suits everyone. Mm -hmm. There are good foods 
you know, that, you know, there's no such thing as a good or a bad food. There are good foods that don't agree with a lot of people. The nightshade family, for example, tomatoes and peppers and potatoes, a lot of people with skin issues, a lot of people with arthritis and inflammation don't do well with nightshades. There's nothing wrong with them. They're, they're packed full of all sorts of good stuff, but they're not right for everyone. Yeah. And that is a powerful thing is to take control or understand that you can take control of your own health because you know you can control what you eat and what you drink. I think that is, it doesn't necessarily have to be that it's not right for you all the time forever as well. I think if you, you can yeah. change things and then later on you can eat like you can. bread or whatever. Yes. You know. And that, that's another thing, bread. I mean, I, I make sourdough bread. I love bread. I, I couldn't live in a world without bread would be a very sad world for me. And again, the number of people that think, oh, I've got a problem with gluten. It's like, why the hell, the hell is that? Bread has been sustaining us since biblical times. Mm -hmm. What is the problem? And okay, gluten is a large protein. And if people have leaky gut and their gut, like, you know, their junctions of gut are not particularly, gluten can get through into your blood and cause you a problem. But the thing is there are so many people now that think they have a problem with gluten the other way to look at that is all the, you know most of the gluten products are made with conventional wheat conventional wheat is sprayed with glyphosate it's a toxic weed killer which totally impacts and uh, it decimates your gut bacteria yeah. and if you look at how most people eat most people are eating conventional wheat every single meal they're having cereal or they'll have toast or, or they'll have a sandwich for lunch or a wrap, they'll have pizza, they'll have pasta, they'll have cakes, they'll have pasta, they'll have cookies. Every single thing has got wheat. And if it's conventional wheat, then it's going to have glyphosate residues in it and that's negative. Well, that's all, all the rest of the stuff that's in there that it doesn't know yeah. processing aids and everything that they, they don't have to mention on the packets that, you know. Yeah, you and here's another thing that I'll share with you that is really quite fascinating. So the people that think, okay, well, I can't do gluten. I'm going to go buy gluten-free stuff, which is a massive industry. <laughs> it's free for a mile. Oh, that's a huge out. You could go down there and there, there's a bag of sugar. It's free from gluten, free from fat. And people are like, oh, well, I'll buy that then. But the, the, the sad thing is a lot of the gluten-free products are really inferior products nutritionally. There's no nutrition. They have to add all sorts of other stuff to take the gluten out. And a very interesting point to make is that there are two emulsifiers that are used in the majority of gluten-free foods, carboxymethyl cellulose and polysorbate 80, and both of them have been proven to damage your gut lining. So people who have already have a damaged gut and think, well, I can't do gluten, I'm just going to go and buy a gluten-free, they're doing themselves more damage and there's no nutrition in a lot of the gluten-free. If you they're go really for naturally gluten-free, well. yeah, but again, that's all about profit and people are just being yeah. misled by thinking that they're making a better choice. Yeah, It's not a better choice. The more processes that a food goes through, the less benefits that there are. And again, I was like, you know, you go into the supermarket and you're like, okay, where's the health food aisle? It's not even an aisle. So what the hell is the rest of it? It's processed crap. Yeah, but mind you, sometimes some of the health food stuff isn't much really healthy Hello? either. It's just like a, another way of marketing a of processed product to you. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. And again, I would say to anyone, in the words of Michael Pollan, the guy who wrote the book, The New York Bestseller, you know, with diet, you know, what you want to do is to yeah, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. Oh, and the other quote I really like from him, if it's, if it's a plant, eat it. If it's made in a plant, don't eat it. <laughs> the, the, the problem is that most of the food that we're eating these days, it's just, it's so far removed from what, what food actually is meant to be that it's not nourishing. Yeah. You know, there's more bad stuff in it than there is good stuff. So if you look at your wee gut microbe, all these wee microbes down there waiting to, you know, do all sorts of great jobs for you, they can't do it unless they've got the building blocks to do it. And that's real food. And also, like, I think all the pesticides and everything that we use that are supposed to be, you know, getting rid of the microbes in our soil, in our plants, and everything, yeah. they're also going to have an effect on our gut. And that's yeah. we are. Of course we are. are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And again, I, I'm, I'm, my first degree was agricultural chemistry. Um, you know, so our soil is absolutely soil microbe. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's a whole load of stuff going on in the soil. It's teeming with microbes that are beneficial. You know, like kids, you go out and play in the dirt. That's fantastic. You're getting all those good microbes and that's the difference between conventional crops and organic conventional crops are grown and with the three main things they need to grow uh, nitrogen potassium and phosphorus the three main things they'll grow in dead soils with no nothing happening at all underneath as opposed to organic stuff that's growing with all this you know teeming microcosm of stuff happening in the soil and organic plants are way better for you than conventional ones 
And again, that just makes sense to me. It's going back to the way that things were grown naturally. We haven't improved anything. All we've done is we've just made things more, we've made things worse for ourselves. And again, the, with the food industry, it all comes back down to profit at the end of the day, not about health. No, but it leaves a lot of really confused people, doesn't it? Because it certainly does. Many, and, yeah. Messages coming out that, oh, this is eat this, eat that, don't eat this, don't eat that. And yeah, so it's very confusing. It's become an absolute minefield. And it's such a shame because for me, food is a joy and a pleasure. And it's something that I look forward to every day. And I know because I know what I eat nourishes my gut. So I can be really smug sitting eating my probiotic chocolate and my nice glass of kombucha, knowing I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying it in my gut bacteria and enjoying it. Not eating something thinking, oh, I don't know, should I be eating this or should yeah. I not eat this? But again, you know, there are so many different ways to eat, that, but there isn't one right one. And again, I've got microbiome. It's as unique as our fingerprints. They're all different. And we don't have the knowledge yet to say, oh, well, that's what a perfect microbiome is. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. We know the right microbes. We know what groups of microbes do certain things. But, you know, everyone has totally different combinations of them. And as you said also, that changes. You can change the makeup of your gut bacteria in a couple of days. And the way you change it is by what you eat and what you drink. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, I had a gut microbiome test done last year, which was fascinating. So you send off a stool sample and you get a 75 page report and it tells you all the microbes that you have in your gut. It gives you risk factor for disease. And for me, you know, I, I like to have knowledge. It's that knowledge is power thing. When you know what you're dealing with and you know you've got, you know, oh great, I've got all the right guys, that's totally fine. But you know that you can, if you got that gut, my, that gut report back and you were lacking in certain things, then you know that you can eat certain foods that will improve that. You start eating some fermented foods and you're putting in, you know, some of the good guys that maybe you're lacking. But it's, it's, a, it's a thing that's in total flux all the time. It yeah. changes all the time. So, did, did your report come back with lots and lots of variety of microbiome yeah well again i mean sad as it was it was last summer my husband was 60 and i thought right i got the test and i thought right i'm going to do it then i thought no i'm going to wait until i'm just eating nothing but fermented food and doing all my kefir every day but of course that day never came because we were having a good time getting old camper van we were away drinking wine eating crisps enjoying myself having fun and, and my two doctor friends kept saying to me have you done that gut test yet and i'm no I, I actually i was waiting to make sure that it was really good. And then I thought, that's really sad. Don't be so silly, just do it. So I did the test, sent it off. They came back and it was really good. I had no high risk for anything. I've got so much um, of the, the um, inflammation fighting microbes, so much butyrate producing bacteria in my gut that I've got literally no inflammation anywhere. Uh, I've got good uh, diversity. The, what, one thing is that came out of it was that I don't eat that much fruit. I eat tons of vegetables and loads of fermented stuff. And I, I can I come and go with it. I do smoothies and juices sometimes. But again, I, I don't plan in advance what I'm going to eat. I just eat what I feel like. So one of the B vitamins was slightly on the low side. Everything else was absolutely fine. Diversity was great. I had no high risk for anything. And I was very happy to know that I had some acromancia, which is one of the microbes that they discovered is to, to, to do with weight loss. Um, uh, th this is a fascinating one. There's this microbe is called Acromancia, and they've discovered that people who are naturally lean have quite a lot of that. People that really struggle to lose weight are people that are overweight or obese have literally none of it. Uh, and again, they're looking into how does that work. The, what they've done is they've done loads of studies in mice, so they've transplanted, you know, the sort of micro, uh, sort of um, fecal sample from a lean mouse into an obese mouse, and lo and behold, the obese mouse loses weight. So there's all sorts of things, and the way that I'm looking at things hopefully that would go in the future is like tar targeted microbes. So if you had someone you thought, okay, well, you're at higher risk for Crohn's or colitis or whatever, but you're lacking in this particular group of microbes that you need to heal your gut lining, then we can give you those microbes and we'll do that job. That would be a wonderful world to be in. That could be bugs, not drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't go for the drugs because the drugs again are masking symptoms. But in terms of Crohn's and colitis, when it, obviously the colon is massively inflamed, you know, the people that have these kind of horrible conditions are hardly eating anything with fiber. So their gut bacteria are starved. So they're not producing butyrate, which heals your gut lining and it also fuels all the cells in your gut. And um, so that's a key thing for people with all that inflammation. They don't have the means to damp that inflammation down because they don't have the right balance of microbes and they're not able to eat a diet to support those microbes. That actually come, brings me to the question that someone had asked on the Facebook page. Let me just check it. It was, um, 
why fermented foods are considered to be good for the gut and yet there are those with IBS, IBD, celiac, for instance, are often told to avoid them? Yeah, but again, you know, this is definitely not a one size fits all thing. The thing is, if you eat fermented foods like sauerkraut, for example, it's going to have loads of probiotics in it. Right. So and again, if you, you've got a gut that's damaged and, and you're going to start putting more probiotics in and fiber and different things, everyone reacts differently to it. But I mean, the, as far as I see it, it's a food, it's not going to do you any harm. You have to taste things and, and know yourself. OK, some people can only have maybe a spoonful of sauerkraut and it upsets their stomach. And everyone's different. But I don't think we should be told blanket by you, you can't eat fermented food because fermented food is superfood. Fermented food is food that is easy to absorb. Everything in it is very, you know, bioavailable. Yeah, okay, it has got live probiotics in it. Yes, it has got fiber in it. So if you've got someone who has a gut issue, but as I've just said to you, anyone with a gut issue is going to have inflammation in their gut. And there's a group of microbes, they're called firmicutes. I had loads of these guys. And again, my mum had ulcerative colitis all her life and so did my aunt. And I was like thinking, oh no, have I got a genetic, am I going to end up with that as well? But when I did the gut microbiome test, I came back as literally zero risk for any of these things because I had such high levels of these butyrate producing bacteria. And what butyrate does is it heals the gut lining and the gut is a, a single cell. It's a very delicate Thing. So if you've got damage to your gut, it just makes sense. You've got these microbes here, but they need a food source. They're not going to work if they don't have a food source. And that's where you've got that really complicating thing. Well, I can't eat fiber. And people with Crohn's, I know, are told to eat an awful diet, bland diet. You can eat you know, chicken and fish, no, no fiber, no fruit. That means your gut microbes are starved. Yeah, they're never going to improve, are they? I would, no. I, I thought of it was maybe you starting in very small amounts and then so that yes. you can slowly introduce the fermented foods and then yes. as, you're, you're, as you heal, you can start to introduce a bit more and you'll be able to tolerate yes. it a bit better. Yeah, exactly. But again, as I say, I mean, I wouldn't recommend that anyone starts going and doing those. As I said with the kombucha, I drank a whole bottle and I wouldn't recommend that anyone does that because it's massively detoxifying. If you have a lot of toxins in your body, it's going to pull them out. Then they need to, you know, they don't go without a fight. A lot of the time people can end up with a healing crisis, a headache, in the toilet for ages, a, a rash. I was fortunate that that didn't happen to me, but it could happen to you. But again, a lot of people think, oh, I must be allergic to that. That's not good. When in actual fact, it's doing the job it's supposed to. It's clearing stuff and you've got to have, you've got to get the toxic stuff out before you can start to feel better. You know, yeah. so that, that there's a lot of lot and it, it comes out really quickly, doesn't it? Maybe your body yeah. has a bit of difficulty dealing with it because it's not used to detoxing yes. it so fast that's exactly, yeah, that, that and, and again i'll say i mean about kombucha and i know that this work kombucha is the best cure ever for a, a hangover because kombucha will clear alcohol residues out your body really fast yeah, okay. and obviously alcohol is a, your body sees it as a toxin mm -hmm. you know so again if you you know and again i, I make probiotic cocktails all the time i have my coffee kombucha and i, I, I but you know mix it up with frozen cherries and martini or whatever i'm having and again i can sit feeling very smug i'm drinking i'm enjoying my wee sophisticated cocktail but what i'm doing is i'm also giving my body the means to get rid of the alcohol once i've enjoyed the effects of it yeah so that's how i look at it and it's like it's all of these things is how can you support your body to do the job it's meant to do and the thing also is i mean i'm getting on a bit in years but i mean i'm incredibly healthy i have no health issues at all i sorted out my skin issues because i listened to my gut intuition i thought to myself right i have a problem with my skin whatever i'm putting in my skin is reacting so i need to find out what that is and stop doing it which is what i did and it took a wee bit of time to do it but i did it and if people would just do that instead of going to the door every time you've got an issue, you're not allowing your body to do the job when it is there, it's just to keep you well. That's why you have an immune system. Yeah. And again, with the, the COVID stuff as well, it's like people waiting for some magical vaccine. Yeah. Where is the information telling people what you should be doing is you should be supporting your own immunity and that will keep you well. That's what your immune system's for. 80% of that is in your gut. So it's massively affected by microbes and as I say, your, your microbes in your gut are in constant communication with your immune system. Yeah. They're sort of raising in. And again, your immune system is, is there to, to keep you protected. So anything that comes into your gut, 
they shouldn't be there. You know, your gut microbes, they'll alert your immune system and say, launch an attack to get rid of it. Or if it's something that's harmless, so that, no, it's okay, it's fine. Gluten, for example, you know, if you, when you then have that leaky gut thing, gluten's getting into your bloodstream, that's alerting your immune system to attack it because it shouldn't be in your bloodstream. Yeah, yeah. And all the autoimmune disease now, and again, that's what I look at. Where are we going with our health? You know, everything is on the increase, and younger and younger people are being diagnosed with things that only older people used to get. Autoimmune disease of every kind is just going through the roof. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancers on the increase, gut problems, IBD, Crohn's colitis, all of it is all climbing up. And people, you know, have to think, well, it's not all because of a lack of a, a drug in our system. It's the way we're living our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, also, yes, the other question I had for you was um, that you do a lot of, um, how do you get kids to have fermented foods? You do a workshop on that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I do kids. And again, I mean, I wouldn't just you know, give kids a load of fermented stuff, but fermented carrot sticks are fantastic for kids. Fermented carrot dips. And again, for kids, for their gut health, really, it's more about getting them to eat a, a variety of foods, plant-based foods. It's making food fun. Have a spiralizer, make apple spaghetti. Apples are fantastic for your gut because there's loads of pectin in them. Um, you know, so you just spiralize an apple uh, and tell kids it's apple spaghetti and they're all eating it. You know, things like popcorn, plain popcorn, popped corn is a whole food, it's got fibre in it. You know, you can put some Himalayan salt on it. Most of the salt ends up in the bowl, but the kids love it. It's a fantastic snack. You know, it, it, different things like making me date in, uh, energy bites, making me energy balls. Uh, as I, I, I did a um, workshop, kids' uh, workshop for a while. So it's just making food fun. Yeah. But again, it's like, you know, people, again, they've totally got it wrong. You know, kids are grown up, don't give them real food. Yeah, absolutely. When do we actually switch them to food that is real? Yeah. Away from bland, pureed up baby food that tastes like nothing. When do they actually start to eat real food? A lot of kids actually really like fermented foods. Yeah. You know, things like olives and a wee bit of sauerkraut. And if you make a wee bit of sauerkraut, you can grate a, an apple or a pear and give them that along with it. And, you know, but again, so many people, so many kids only eat sweet or salty stuff. They don't eat anything that's sour and that's bitter, so they're not allowed their taste buds don't develop properly. Because everything they eat is either insanely sweet or insanely salty, and their body goes between one and another. You know, I have chocolate, then I have crisps, then I have chocolate, then I have crisps. And in the meantime, all the stuff where you'll get all the balance is all the plants in the middle. Yeah. I think people don't give kids the benefit either of thinking that they have a more complex palate. Yeah, just exactly. Think, oh, just very basic, you know, you can only eat this stuff. I mean, my kids, they love like uh, sauerkraut and stuff, so, you know, they would just, and olives and Brilliant. all that stuff. So. Fabulous. But again, I mean, I make a lovely bit as a fig and olive tapenade. It's fantastic stuff. It's dried figs, um, uh, green olives, black olives, some extra virgin olive oil, a bit of rosemary, some kombucha vinegar. It is absolutely fantastic stuff for your gut, and it is absolutely delicious. You're having cheese and cracker, have a wee bit of that in the side, and you've just added a, you know, a fantastic food source for your gut bacteria. But I do, I do think you're right. I think a lot of people are scared now with kiddo. Don't give them this. Don't don't give them that. I've got four girls and there's a big gap. My oldest is nearly 30, my youngest is 19. And when I had the first one, the, the advice was totally different to when I had the youngest one, you know, and uh, you'll know that yourself. Oh, no, you're not allowed to do that. You can do that. And I actually wonder how the hell did my generation actually manage to grow up okay? But now you look at, you know, kids, so many more kids now with asthma, eczema, allergies, behavioral issues. That was never a thing when I was young. And, and when I was young, everyone walked to school, everyone ate real food, nobody ate processed crap, nobody had loads of sugar, you get sweets once a week, that was a treat, that was okay, and now everything's wrong, and people, again, mums have lost their own innate judgment as to what is right, and they're looking to somebody else to tell them, and the, the advice changes all the time. Yeah. Don't give them solid food, you can't give them this, only give them bland stuff. My thing is, you know, and again, we're a country that we have a, a you go take your kids out, a kids' menus full of crap, yeah. What yeah. other country would you go to where kids are given a separate menu that's like pizza and chips, sausage and chips? Where is the real food? Any other country, the kids would be eating smaller portions of real food. So yeah, when do you make that yeah. switch <laughs> between, okay, that's processed crap, and kids then think that's what real food is and they won't try real food? Yeah. 
They're probably and I've done adults as well are eating the same thing, so that, that kind of gives yeah. I mean, I've done workshops. I used to do workshops in Castle Milk. Bless them, they get my and I'd go and do uh, 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 big cook, little cook, you know, workshops. And again, it's it's a deprived area. Castle Milk's one of the worst areas, and the kids loved the cooking workshops. They used to have waiting lists for they wanted to come and do six week blocks, you know, and you'd be with the kids, and they'd have to come with their their, their mum, with their gran, or an adult. And these were mostly wee kids that weren't doing particularly well at school, but they loved to come to the cooking thing, you know. And you'd be I'd be trying to engage them in making smoothies and oh. Oh, look, we're making them all different colours. And we put, I did remember saying to somebody once held up spinach and said, Do you know what that is? And the wee boy said, Is it grass? And I thought, well, we don't eat grass. Would you eat grass? They had no idea. They had no idea about what most of the things were. And again, if, if you, you show kids things, that was a challenge. It was a bit like Blue Peter's, like here's one I've made earlier. I would make soup, but I would blend about seven different things. We'd make lentil soup, but it would have red pepper in it, it would have um, potatoes in it, it would have uh, turnip in it, it would have onions in it, it would have various other things. If you showed them all of them and then said, we're making the soup, like, I, I don't want to have that. But when you made it and you let them try it first and then like, oh yeah, that's really nice, so I like that. And then they discover there's vegetables in it. And we would do like healthy pick and mix. And you'd say, okay, I'd have some big chocolate buttons. You could allow to have some of them, but you had to have like popcorn and pretzels and dried apricots and, and seeds and different things. And they all did. We had made wee fun bags up. You know, we got a wee bag and made like a wee cone and they all had to take different things. And they all tried stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing, you know, and again, make the wee date and all energy bites and I'd put like dark chocolate chips in the middle of them. So they would all eat all the good stuff to get to the chocolate in the middle. And the date, well, there were dates in them, there was oats in them, there was coconut, you put sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, and they were eating all the good stuff. And I'd put in a few chocolate chips as well, and they loved them. You know, we'd make wee pizzas, funny face pizzas. And this was always good fun because I'd say, right, the challenge is you have to make a face, but you've got to make a face with vegetables. So the kids that would say, oh, I'm going to like cheese pizza. I'm like, well, you're not winning any prizes for your funny face pizza then. So I would take things along, like, you know, bits of red onion and bits of pepper for a mouth and, you know, olives for eyes and, um, you know, mushrooms for noses and all these different things, you know, frozen peas, frozen sweet corn. And before you knew it, the kids were actually all having great fun. Oh, can I try this? I want to try that. They were all making, you know, even the ones that said they don't like anything, they like, free, you know, peas and sweet corn. Most kids will eat that. Yeah. You know, kids like putting mushrooms on and then, you know, taking photographs of it. And they were all having a great time, just engaging them with it, but letting them do it. And then we made, like, you know, soda bread. That was another one that was really sort of funny. We discussed right bread. So here's one I've made earlier. Let them try the bread. Yeah, anybody know what is bread? So we discovered, yeah, okay, flour is the main ingredient. So I said, anybody know where flour comes from? And when my boy says, um, yeah, does it come? It comes from a cow. I'm um, like that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Somebody else said. Uh, no, I think it maybe comes. It comes from a farm. It comes from a farm. But you know, it, that, that's they didn't relate actual food to what it was, mm -hmm. and it, it was really quite astonishing. But by the end of the time, I mean, again, I would say things like walnuts. Look, what does a walnut look like? Look, it looks like your brain. That's because it's really good for your brain. So eventually, they would start to, you know, look at carrots. So if you cut a carrot, it looks like your eyes. It's really good for your eyesight. And one day I had gone along and I'd take, we were doing dips, we were making different dips and carrot sticks. And one wee boy said, could he have a carrot? Before I knew it, everybody wanted a carrot and they all sat and ate them. So it really was quite a, a, a fun and an interesting thing. But again, it's to get, some of the adults were actually worse than the kids. Yeah, yeah. And they tend to see the adults often as like, oh, he's not going to eat that. And you're like, well, yes. give us a chance. <laughs> I know, yeah, I, I, but that, that is the problem because we've now got a whole generation of kids growing up with a very limited diet and you can guarantee they're not going to have the right balance of microbes in the gut yeah. and they're only going to set themselves up for a problem. And again, as I say, the whole um, asthma, eczema, and again, that comes back down to your microbiomes established when you're born. If you're born natural delivery, you get all the your your as you go through the birth canal, you've got all the microbes. You're breastfed, you get all the microbes. There's actually um, a, a ligosaccharides in breast milk, and this was a bit of a conundrum for a while. People are like, why why is there stuff in breast milk your baby can't digest? Because it passes through the stomach and it's food for their gut microbes. Mm -hmm. So all of that is established very early on in life. And if you're born by C-section in a sterile environment, you're going to be colonised by a totally different group of bacteria, mostly skin ones uh, and not from your mother. And if you're not breastfed, then there's another thing. So many kids, antibiotics in the first year of their life destroys, it changes the balance. 
And the other thing as well is with kids, so many of the time, your immune system needs something to do. As soon as they've got a wee bit of a high temperature, oh, giving them calcol, to me, that's actually saying, okay, well, look, we don't trust your immune system to do that job for you. That's what your immune system's there for. It's almost like that, well, you just stand out the way, we're just going to give you this instead. And it's that fear thing, as soon as there's any problem, well, we need antibiotics, and now look what's happened. You know, there's so many bacteria now that are resistant to all the... The, uh, you know, the antibiotics, because we've totally overused them. They're all through the food chain as well. Um, and again, yeah, really, really bad. And bacteria are actually very, very good at adapting. That's what they're good at. And that's a good thing, actually, bad and good. So when you do your fermented veggies and you create a nice, a nice environment, a selective environment for them, they will multiply like mad. So you will end up in your jar of sauerkraut or your jar of kimchi, absolutely tons of the good guys. And it's only the good guys that can survive in that environment, the bad guys can't. And another thing I'm just going to mention briefly, which is one of my favourite things, is fermented garlic. Now everyone knows garlic is nature's antibiotic, but if you ferment garlic, the health be the benefits are way up through the roof. And fermented garlic is effective against things like MRSA and a lot of the infections that normal antibiotics, that there's no um, antibiotics for them. But fermented garlic is so powerful because fermented garlic has 27 different things in it that are, is considered antibacterial. So um, bacteria are clever, so most antibiotics are single mode of action. So bacteria are quite clever. So if you get the ones that are resistant to that, you know that one antibiotic, you can guarantee the next lot of bacteria will all be resistant. But if you've got something like garlic, it's too complicated a thing. So they're not that clever. So so far, uh, fermented garlic is my go-to thing. And um, for if I ever have, not that I ever have any infection, but if I did, that's my go-to thing. So I've just made some fermented garlic, but it, most of it's gone blue. Is that perfect? That is fine. Okay. That is a good thing. <laughs> that is just the sulfur compounds that, that you know that sometimes happen. And in Chinese um, terms, that's a sign of uh, good luck. So that's good. Okay. So you just keep all your blue cloves and they'll be fine. I actually, with my fermented garlic, I don't even put it in the fridge anymore. I just ferment it in my 2% salt brine and I just leave it sitting out because it is so powerful. You will never get any mold growing on it. And that to me just shows you how powerful it is. So my last jar that I've just finished has been fermenting for a year. So I get a bit nervous when I don't have much fermented garlic. So I've got a big giant jar that is absolutely full uh, of garlic. And that is one of the best things you can do because when you ferment garlic, it becomes mellow. It doesn't linger in your breath. It's not like harsh. If you add raw garlic to dips and dressings, it tastes a bit harsh. I don't like raw garlic particularly, but the fermented garlic is fantastic because it adds all the benefits. Garlic is prebiotic. But then you ferment it, it's also probiotic. So it's just an absolute massive powerhouse of good stuff. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Just how much you yeah. can use nature just to... Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, maybe you could just tell me um, where people could get in contact with you, where they can find out about what you do, maybe like yeah. I'll post like links and everything, but if you could... Yeah. Me... Well, I have a blog. I started doing my blog about five years ago. It's called blognourishedbynature.com. Um, and uh, I, I mean, what happened was I had so many recipes. I just started it to share plant-based recipes, but I ended up adding so many categories on the side that it's a bit confusing. And I'm not good with technology, but then over the last couple of years, I've been running a lot of workshops and things. And I thought she tried to help me to make it more like a website. So it looks better, but it's still a bit confusing. But there is a search bar that you can use and I've added categories, but I'm still in the process of adding recipes into those categories. But what I do now is I share loads of stuff on Facebook I'm on Facebook as Nourished by Nature UK and I'm on Instagram. I'm on Instagram all the time as well as Be Nourished by Nature. So what I tend to do is I share a lot of recipes online and I just share the kind of food that I'm, you know, that I'm making and that I'm eating with is to try and give people different ideas. And again, really one of the key things you can do for your gut microbiome is to eat a more diverse diet. And it's plants, it's fiber, it's what you need, it's fiber. It's polyphenols and phytochemicals. So all your herbs and spices, things like lemon zest all of these things are all incredibly good and good fats so that's what you need to be eating and you need to be eating instead of five a day which is not enough you, you need to be aiming for the, the new guidelines really are it's like 30 a week of different sources of fiber so again that's quite a fun game to play and think okay well how many have i eaten today this has become a new game actually this is my new game how many prebiotic sources of fiber can i add to that that made we beat root bliss bites this week i saw that and, um, <laughs> did you see that yeah I managed to get 11 sauces into it and I was very pleased with myself and also made lovely wee, um, like sausage rolls, not sausage rolls, 
uh, with puff pastry and I thought I'm going to make myself a nice prebiotic filling. So what I did, I mean, things like leeks and onions and garlic, they're fantastic. They're really good for your gut bacteria. So I had leeks and um, garlic, onion, spinach, sort of uh, cooked all that. Added chickpeas for more fiber. Added flat leaf parsley from the garden. Added lemon zest for polyphenols. Added some seaweed flakes and added some cubed feta. So in that as well, I had absolutely tons of good stuff. Then, okay, puff pastry is not particularly good, but it's delicious. And who doesn't like something puff pastry? So I sort of put it on and rolled it up. And then what I did was I sprinkled seeds on the top. So milk, um, linseeds, I think, and sesame seeds and chia seeds. So mm -hmm. taking something like a sausage roll, which is no benefit at all, I made something that had actually loads of benefits. And it tasted absolutely delicious. Uh, and it looked great. So I haven't actually put that recipe on the blog yet. But when I did put it on Instagram, I had w lots of interest in it. I mean, I even ferment things like potatoes. I ferment all my potato wedges. I make fermented potato uh, tomato ketchup. Um, I've got a fridge full of kombucha. Uh, I, I just continually think, how can I, you know, add something probiotic to that? And it's a very good game to play. And it gets great though, because good. all the recipes and stuff that you put up is is a really good source of inspiration because you get you get kind of stuck, you know, in your ways making yes. the same things all the time. So it's quite good to yes. see other people say, "Hey, why don't you try this?" Oh, that's a good thing. I'll try that. I know, yeah, I know. But again, I mean, none of the stuff that I do is complicated. It's all pretty simple stuff. But even if it comes to dips, okay, I always say to everyone, okay, I know cake and hummus, that's a fantastic snack. But I make things like beetroot walnut dip. I make the fig and olive tapenade. I make a Moroccan butter bean dip using different things and putting different things in it. You know, I maybe have a rice cake instead of an oat cake, or I make sourdough crackers and I have it. It's just mixing it up a wee bit. But so many people are just stuck in a bad a routine and don't have any ideas. And what I'm trying to do is to show people, you know, that you can eat incredibly delicious food that's also really good for you. Yeah. And it's like, well, why wouldn't you if you knew how to do it? Yeah, it's like, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I don't take my health for granted. I never have done. But I take steps every day to make sure that I'm nourishing my gut because what I know now about the gut microbiome is that's where it's all happening. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feed your gut microbiome and look after them and stop putting all the stuff into your body that's causing your body inflammation and stress and disrupting the balance of microbes in your gut, you know, then we're all responsible for our own health. Yeah. And that, to me, is a very empowering thing. You yeah. know, and it doesn't matter, you know, where you're at with your health, you can always improve it. And you can also eat, you know, far better food. So that's what it's about. But again, going back to my stuff, I was doing loads of workshops, but I had to sadly postpone. I had 10 fully booked workshops before COVID sort of hit. So I'm going to have to re, um, reschedule all of those ones. Uh, and then I'll be putting new dates out because I was doing workshops on veggies, um, workshops on drinks, when you're making your own skincare. Uh, one in sourdough and they were all really popular just just fun workshops to come because for me the key thing is to let people try all the different things you know and again fermented veggies I, I mean, people say i don't like sauerkraut i mean my sauerkraut is it's absolutely delicious i make pineapple turmeric ginger sauerkraut i make um, um lemon and dill sauerkraut it's my new one is rhubarb lime and ginger you can make all sorts of things yeah. Uh, gorgeous kimchi that's really lovely and spicy there's so many things you can make and they taste great and i don't I, life's too short to eat food you don't enjoy yes. but it's all about making a better choice that's what it's about make a better choice and think about your gut microbes and those three f's that the fiber the polyphenols and the good fats that's what you need you know so stupid diets and restrictive diets they're not good yeah, calorie counting and you know, all that kind of rubbish yeah. oh it's stupid <laughs> it makes no sense absolutely no sense at all the calories from an avocado are totally different to the calories from a mars bar yeah and that comes back to your gut microbes as well because i was saying about that my uh, acromancia um which is a lot of lean people have a lot of and, and you know heavy people have none of so it's not so much what you're eating it's how your body actually uses that food and that, that also is up to your gut microbes, how your body uses it. Is your body storing it as fat or has your body been more efficient in using it for energy? Mm -hmm. And that all comes down to the makeup of your gut as well. And you can change that. Yeah. So it's, it's massively exciting and fascinating. And it is. Of, of, you know, of, um, uh, you know, things that you can start to think about. And for me, it's really just, it's all about the food. And because I'm science and a bit of a geek, I mean, I do love researching stuff. And again, my own personal story of my skin, I kind of sorted that out. So I felt really pleased with myself for doing that. But so many people with psoriasis, 
and um, rosacea and all of these things, they are gut issues, they're coming from your gut. Your skin is your, your body, it's like your largest body of detoxification. It's your body trying to get your attention. Mm -hmm. If there's something wrong, if you have niggly problems or something, your body's trying to tell you something. So it's time to strike back and think, okay, how am I living my life? Am I, I've got a lot of stress, am I eating really badly? Am I drinking too much alcohol? There's so much stuff we can do, but I think we've just lost that sense of that we have any control over anything. Yeah. But we've got control over what we eat and what we drink, and that is a massive thing. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. The sun's coming out now. I'm getting a bit hot. I'm sitting in my conservatory. <laughs> so got, there's so much building noise going on, and I've shut the window. I thought, I better not open the window. So if I start dripping sweat down my face soon, it's just getting a bit hot. So. Well, I don't think I've got any more questions. That was, I mean, I could talk to you like all day because it's just, it's just such a fascinating topic. But oh, now I'm feeling really inspired to go and make some more ferments. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go feed my poor kombucha as well because it's feeling a bit uh, neglected, I think. <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, kombucha is fine. It'll be totally fine just hanging out and, until you want to use it again. One tip for kombucha as well for scobies, don't put them in the fridge. Just keep them in the liquid and they'll be fine. Just put them in a wee cupboard somewhere and you can keep them for months and they'll be fine. Because as they have got so many of them, I can't possibly be brewing all of them all at the one time. I would just end up overrun. And my youngest daughter, she makes her own beer as well. So uh, we've got, she's got her beer stuff and I've got all my kombucha stuff. So yeah, it, it gets a wee bit. It does, but again, these are all wee living things. So it yeah. takes me quite a long time to tend to all my ferments. Um, mm -hmm. So I just like to create chaos in my kitchen and just make a big mess everywhere. And But you know what? It's great and I totally love it and I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah, um, I really wouldn't. So I'm looking forward to getting my workshops up and running again, hopefully September um, sometime, because there is no time like now to start to support your own immunity and your own body. Uh, so again, where is the message going out telling people that? Yeah, well, we'll be there, but I think all of us, know that should be out. yeah, we should I be out there with that message. Yeah, well, they can't sell, they can't sell that though, can they? <laughs> of course they can't. Yeah, but again, that's what it all comes back down to. Yeah, the food industry as well. Well, they're, they're there mainly it's to make money it's not for your health don't care about your health you know you, but it's all about trying to hoodwink you into thinking something is healthy when you read between the lines but actually that is not a better choice and again the whole gluten-free thing as i said that is absolutely yeah, not yeah. a better choice and actually gluten-free stuff yes processed gluten-free stuff is full of absolute rubbish and there's no benefit in it and it damages your gut um yeah. artificial sweeteners are another one oh, yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I actually find it all the, fatter with them anyway rather than thinner aren't they <laughs> on all sorts yeah of i know yeah but again they're artificial so what your body doesn't know what the hell yeah, they are yeah yeah you know your body is quite uh you know it's, it's a miracle of engineering everything else your body works really well if you if you feed it what it needs but these days there are thousands and thousands of chemicals that, that are going into food that are on products that people are using all the time that are getting absorbed through the skin into their blood and you know causing all sorts of disruption yeah. And it's no wonder that we've got the chronic disease that we have. It's absolutely no wonder. I am not surprised when I look at what people are eating and, you know, and, and just thinking, oh, well, I'm just getting old. I'm just going to become unwell. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I have no intention of getting any disease anytime soon. And if I do, I will be addressing it first by what I'm eating and my own lifestyle. Um, and for me, it's, as I say, it's bugs, not drugs. <laughs> uh, I would go drugs as an absolute last resort and absolutely of course I've saved loads of thousands of lives I'm not saying that but I mean I, I've got my own wee natural sort of things that I use so I, I don't I don't need to go and um, yeah, get drugs which is uh, good for me and good for my wee gut microbes as well I like to look after them and then they reward me with all these incredible things that they do yeah so yeah, it's a fascinating world but as you say you could we could you could talk for months about it <laughs> And again, as I say, it's a typical oh, yeah, thing anyway. what they're discovering. Yeah. And it's not a simple thing. It's not a, you know, a one size fits all thing at all. It's massively complicated, but it's got huge potential yeah. for us and for our health. And if we could ever, you know, get like targeted probiotics. And one thing I, I was just going to say before we leave that actually does work is people with that C. diff infection, which is a dreadful, horrible infection, um, getting a fecal transplant for somebody who is healthy, that cures it. And that has got like a, some, a 90% cure rate. Yeah. And that's something that there is no other treatment for. And it works if you just get the right microbes, the microbes sort it all out for you. And that's pretty new technology as well, isn't it? The yeah. Stuff, yeah. I think yeah, I'll probably I mean, learn a lot more about that, you know, as it goes along as well, obviously. I know, but again, as I say, they've done, you know, experiments with wee mice and whatever, and transplanting the gut microbiome from one into the other. And it, is, it changes everything. It yeah. really does. 
And again, I mean, there've been research with somebody with psoriasis and somebody who's alcoholic have got a similar disordered gut microbiome. Oh, wow. So, you know, what, what comes first? Does the disease cause the change in the microbiome or is it the microbiome that's, that's causing the disease? Mm -hmm. So it's that chicken and egg thing. But again, as I say, it's all, it's, all, it's all to play for. There's so much information and so much research money now getting played into the microbiome because it's, it's the, the control center of your, your whole body. Yeah. And it, it controls absolutely everything and every single aspect of your health. And again, as I say, you can control the makeup of your gut by what, the foods that you're eating. And if you start eating more a more diverse diet, and again, as I say, it's all about fiber. If you can eat some fermented foods, fantastic. They're like super fertilizer for your gut bacteria. Get some, you know, eat some sourdough. It's a far better choice than a, you know, a, a, a loaf out of the supermarket. Yeah, but again, it's people that too, are gluten intolerant can actually... Um, they can tolerate gluten, um, sourdough, can't they? Because of the fact that they can. There's so many people that have come to workshops that have got a problem with gluten. You can eat my sourdough absolutely with no digestive upset mm -hmm. at all because the slow fermentation, the bacteria in the starter have broken down the gluten, all the phytic acids are gone. You can absorb all the minerals. It's a whole different thing. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's been so nice to chat to you. And uh, as I say, if anyone's got any concerns at all about their gut or anything else I can help with, you can contact me through either my Facebook page or my Instagram or my, bl my blog. Um, uh, and as I say, um, you know, that, that sorting out your gut microbiome is absolutely worth doing. It is the key to your health. And for kids as well, as you say, really is all about getting kids to eat more of a, a, a bigger variety and get them to some different things from an earlier age. And don't be scared, you know, by health visitors or whatever telling you they can only eat bland, pureed up stuff that doesn't taste of anything. Yeah. I don't, I don't go with that at all. Um, but anyways, I say it's up to everyone. But I do think that mothers these days are they're scared to trust their own gut. They've been told so many different things. And as I say, for me with four kids, I was told totally different stuff all the way yeah, through. Changes, totally it? different. The rules changed all the time. And I thought, well, do you know what? I've grown up okay. I'm fine. So I'm just going to do what my mum did, which is what I did. And my kids are all okay. <laughs> they're all fine. None of them have an asthma, eczema or anything else. They're all totally fine. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to have to shoot because I'm getting incredibly hot. Yes. It's been so <laughs> nice to chat to you. You too.